Um, before we start, I'm just going to show a slide here with our sponsors. So we really would like to thank our sponsors for making this event possible. So we'd like to thank Script Runner, DQ Global, Proximo3, Redspire, Agilisys, and Hitachi Solutions. And before we start, I'm also going to just mention uh, some background information about me. So I'm working for a Norwegian consultancy company called Miles, and I work as a manager for AI and big data. I am a Microsoft MVP in AI, and I'm also part of the Norwegian.net user group in Oslo, and uh, also part of the Oslo AI. And together with Eve Pardy, who is also an AI MVP, we are running an online AI school called AI42. And if you want to know more about me, you can find my social media links on this slide. But now uh, to the agenda for today. So we're going to be talking uh, first about machine learning. So I will give everyone a basic introduction to what machine learning is. And then after that, we're going to go dive deeper into TensorFlow, and in particular, TensorFlow.js. And we will have two demos today, one where we will build um, machine learning application from scratch and we will run it in the browser. And then another way we will use a already pre-trained model, and then we will build an image classifier using that pre-trained model. But first, what is machine learning? So you might think that machine learning is something new because it's a quite a hot topic today. But the, the matter of fact is that it's been around all since the late 1950s. So there was a researcher called Arthur Samuel. He said that machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And I can also, also say that machine learning is a pattern recognition in historical data. So some applications of machine learning, you, for example, you can do prediction. And a classical example here is if you have a house and you want to predict what will the price of this house be. So then you can use some information that you know about the house, like where is it located, how many rooms, what's the square meters, and so on. And you can make a prediction of the house price. Or you can think about recommendation systems. So when you purchase something on the web, usually you get some recommendations of other products you might be interested in. And this uh, is typically by a recommendation system that can provide you with information about things that are based on your historical purchases and also on people who have has a similar uh, purchase pattern as yourself. And that also brings us to clustering. So if you have a web shop, for example, then you can cluster your, uh, your customers into different segments or different clusters, and then you can specialize the information uh, so it's targeted to a specific cluster. And we also have image recognition and text recognition and speech recognition. So one way that we do machine learning is called supervised learning. And in supervised learning, what we have is we have historical input data, and we also have access to historical output data. And based on this, we can build a model, and then we can train this model so that it can take new data that it hasn't seen, and then it can provide us with a recommendation. Um, and we will have a look at supervised learning, actually, in our first example in a short while. But as I said here, machine learning has been around since the late 50s. And the question is, why is it such a popular topic today? So, um, uh, so one of the reasons we can see here on this slide is that there are a number of enabling technologies. So one of them is that we now have access to relatively cheap real-time sensors that can provide us with lots of data that we need in order to do machine learning. And we also have big data solutions, so we can do transformation and loading of our data in the cloud. And we have access to machine learning algorithms that we can scale uh, also in the cloud and that we can make use of in our own applications uh, through various APIs. And just for completeness, I would also like to talk a little bit about programming languages here. So uh, it is actually so that you can do machine learning in any type of language. But uh, the thing is that you don't really want to start out from scratch. Instead, you would like to use a language where you have lots of support from different libraries. So two of the most popular and common languages for you doing machine learning are Python and R. 
So Python has traditionally been more popular among people coming from a computer science background, whereas R has been more popular among people coming from a statistical background and people coming from academia. So now when we've covered a little bit about the basis on, uh, uh, on what machine learning is, we're gonna go more into TensorFlow. Uh, so TensorFlow is an open source library that was developed by the Google Brain team and it expresses its algorithms using something called tensor operations. And one, and I will also describe what, ten, what a tensor is in a short while here. And um, uh, one of the benefits with using TensorFlow is that it supports distributed computing. And that's a huge advantage if you're gonna be running, for example, deep learning or neural networks. So what is a tensor? So tensor is, uh, is something that we can find from mathematics. So in mathematics, we can differentiate between a scalar, which is just a single real-time number. You can have a vector, which is a collection of numbers. And you can have a matrix, which is sort of a two-dimensional uh, collection of numbers. And then a tensor is just like a container where you can store either scalars or vectors or matrices. And the important thing here is that the TensorFlow library is only working with tensors. So when we get our data, we somehow need to be able to transform our data into the tensor format. And if you use a Jupyter Notebook or if you use Python, then what you can do is you can import the TensorFlow library and then you can start up a new TensorFlow session. Then you can define some constants, like here we define A with a number of 10 and B with value of 32. And then you can do a mathematical operation. So you can run your session and you can add A plus B here and print it out on the console. But now the topic for today is TensorFlow.js. So TensorFlow.js is a JavaScript library, so uh, it will make you able to both do training and also deploy models in the browser and also on Node.js. So now we actually reach the time for our first demo where we will build uh, TensorFlow application here from scratch. So let me switch over here to my browser. And let me also switch over maybe to Visual Studio Code. So as we can see here in Visual Studio Code, we have an index.html file. And in this file, we are importing two libraries. So the first one is the TensorFlow JavaScript, the minimized version. And the second one is the TensorFlow JavaScript visualization component, also a minimized version. And then we are referring here to script.js file where we will do all of our uh, machine learning. And right now, if we look at that file, it uh, only prints out on the console log, hello TensorFlow. So if we go to the browser and we run this, now we can see that it just prints out hello TensorFlow. So basically we're starting here out here from scratch. So one of the things that we were talking about is that we need to have access to, uh, to lots of data here when we're gonna do machine learning. So, uh, so luckily for us, we have some data accessible here in a JSON file, which is over here. And uh, this data is car data. So you can see both um, the name or the model of the car, and you can see the miles per gallon, the number of cylinders and the horsepower. And what we would like to find out here is if there is any sort of relationship between miles per gallon and the horsepower. And one way that we can do this is we can load our data into our JavaScript application, and then we can do a plot, a scatter plot, because then we can see easily see if there is any type of relation here. And um, uh, and that's uh, quite important to do some uh, some data analysis initially, so that you can actually see is this a problem where machine learning is a good candidate for solving that problem. So let us define a function where we can uh, read in this JSON file. So let me add a function here to uh, our Visual Studio Code. So in this function, get data. What we do is we fetch our JSON file with the car data. And then after that, we uh, map our data so that we get MP MPG is the miles per gallon, and then we get horsepower 
which is the horsepower from the data. And then we also do some filtering. So we filter out all the null values and then we return the clean, cleaned data. Uh, then after that, we also need to have a function here uh, so that we can run our, uh, our function. So let me add that. So here in our run function, uh, what we do here is first we call our get data uh, function and uh, to read in the data. And then after that, we map our data so that on the x axis we get the horsepower, and then on the y axis we get the miles per gallon. And then after that, we wanted to do a plot. So then we can just use this TensorFlow visualization component. And we can call the render function, and we can define that we want to see a scatter plot. So we, um, uh, yeah. We render a scatter plot and then we'll see if there is any type of relationship between these two. And then we will add, as this example continues, we will add more code here be below. And then we add an event listener, so it listens to the DOME content loaded event. And when that event is issued, uh, we will run this run function. So let us save this and then let us go over to, uh, to the browser and to our example and let's run this. And then we can see here that we got a plot here. So, uh, um, so luckily for us, we can see here that there the seems to be a relationship between uh, horsepower, which is on the x-axis, and miles per gallon, which is on, on the y-axis. And, and that's a good for us because that means that then our machine learning algorithm can actually learn something, can learn this relation. Because an, uh, it could be the uh, another option could have been that all of our data points would have been scattered all throughout the plot. And then it wouldn't have been a good candidate for machine learning because then our machine learning algorithm wouldn't have been able to learn something because there is, isn't really any relation to learn. Because now as we can clearly see here, there is some sort of relationship. And then it's possible for us to create a machine learning model where we can learn this relationship and then we can feed it in with new data that it hasn't seen. And then we can predict some new miles per gallon based on this new horsepower. So, uh, um, so the first thing, uh, so the goal here is then that we want to train a model for the input is one number, it's horsepower, and also our prediction is an another number, the miles per gallon. So here we have a one-to-one -one mapping. So what we will do is we will use these values that we have here, and then we will feed them into a neural network. And this neural network will learn from examples so it can predict the miles per gallon from a new value of horsepower. And this is an example of supervised learning that we were talking about a little bit earlier in the presentation. So the first thing, so now when we identify that this is actually a good problem for machine learning, then what we need to do now is we need to define something called the model architecture. So in machine learning terms, um, uh, an algorithm is, uh, so this is about what kind of algorithm should the model be using in order to compute its answers. So machine learning models are algorithms that will take an input and then it will produ produce an output. And in this case, we will use a neural network. Uh, so here the algorithm will be a layer of neurons with different weights, and these weights will govern the output. And during the training process, this algorithm will learn the best values for these weights. So let us add a function here where we actually can create a model. Let, let me go back to we should do the code and then let me add a function. What we do here in our function, we define our model as TensorFlow sequential model. And this is one of the most simple models that we have in TensorFlow. So it is called sequential because the input flows straight down to its output. But of course, there are much more complex models that can enable both multiple input, multiple output, and also branches in your model. Then after that, we call model.add, and this will add an input layer to our model. And this is connected to something that we call a dense layer. So dense layer is a type of layer that will multiply its input with a matrix that we call weights, and then it will add a number that we call a bias to the result. And since this is the first layer of the network, we need also to specify the input shape. And the input shape is, in this case, it's one, because we have one number as an input and that's the horsepower of the car. Now we need to define units, so you, the unit sets how big will this weight matrix be. 
in this layer. And here we also set it to one, so that means that there will be one weight for each of the input features of our data. And then we can create our output layer where we set the units also to one because we want to have one number as the output. So now when we have defined our model, the next thing that we uh, want to do is we want to create an instance of our model. So let us go to the run function. So here, and then we call the create model function where we created the model. And then we're using this TensorFlow visualization component in order to show a model summary. So if you've been using um, TensorFlow in, uh, in a, a Jupyter Notebook, it's very common that we print out a model summary to see that the model looks Okay, and we can also do it here in the web browser. So let us save this and let's go over here to the browser and we reload this. And then we get our plot there and then underneath our plot, we get a model summary. And here it tells us how many layers do we have in our model, what is the output shape and the number of parameters and also if they are trainable or not. So now when we have defined our model, then the next thing that we need to do is we need to prepare our data for training. And as I said before here, TensorFlow is only working with tensors as its format. So we need to somehow, uh, uh, somehow transform our data, this car JSON data into the tensor format in order for us to be able to use TensorFlow. So let us add a function where we can convert our data to uh, tensors. So let me go here to resource to the code and then we can add a function like this. So here's a function convert to tensor data and then what we do here is the first thing that we do is we do a shuffle of the data and the reason why we do this shuffle is because when we the training of our machine learning model, we will divide our data into smaller subset, subsets. And these subsets we call batches. And when we train, we want these batches to be as representative as possible for the whole data set. And that's why we would like to do this shuffling so that we get data from all across the data distribution. And that has some advantages. So one of the advantages is that now we will not run the risk of learning things that are only dependent on the order of the input data since we're taking data from all across randomly all across our uh, whole data set. And the second advantage is that we are not so sensitive to structures in subgroups. So for example, it could be for one reason or the other that maybe there was a high horsepower for the ha first half of the training data. And that would be a relationship that would not be representative for the whole data set. And then what we do then is we convert our data into tensors by using a predefined function, TensorFlow Tensor2D. And then we get uh, our input, which is the horsepower. So we call that an input tensor and our output, which, which is the miles per gallon. And we call that our label tensor. And, uh, um, and then the, the next thing that we do, which is also best practice, is that we do some normalization of the data. So here we want to normalize the data so all our data will be in the range of zero to one. And this is something that we call a mean max scaling. And normalizing is important because uh, many, or in, many of the internals of machine learning models, they are designed to work with numbers that are not too big. So if we do this normalization, we don't run into any risk of getting any problems because of that. And then what we do finally here is we return. So we return the inputs and we return the labels and we also return our min max bounds. And the reason why we do this is because when we've done our, um, when we've done our machine learning uh, predictions, then we need to somehow be able to transform it back into the same scale as our original data was. So that's why we are returning back this input max and input mean. So then we can do like an unnormalization when we are finished. Um, so now, uh, what we want to do now is we would actually like to train our model. So let us uh, have a function for training our model and we can add it here. 
Here's the first thing that we do here is we need to compile our model before we train it. And when we compile it, we need to set some parameters for the compilation. So one of the parameters is the optimizer. So the optimizer is an algorithm that will decide on the updates to the model as it sees new examples. So there are many, many types of optimizers in TensorFlow. And here we picked the Adam optimizer because the Adam optimizer is quite effective in practice and it requires little configuration. And then the second thing that we need to define is a loss function. So loss function is a, type, a sort of a quality function that will tell us how well the model is doing when it learns each of these different patches. So here we are using the mean squared error to enable to compare the predictions made by the model with the true values. And then finally, we need to set a batch size and also the number of epochs. So, um, so the batch size is referring to the size of these data subsets that the model will see here. And some common batch sizes can be anything between anything from 32 to 512. And there isn't really an ideal batch size that will solve everything. And it's actually a little bit of science in itself to set the batch size. So here we just go with like a default value of 32. And then the epochs refers to the number of times that our model will look at the entire data set. So here we will take 50 iterations through the data set. So finally, then we can start our training loop. So we call model.fit with our input and our labels and the configuration. And then one of the nice things uh, with this is we can also define callback. So this callback, we're using this TensorFlow visualization component in order to do some monitoring. So we print out for each epoch, we will print out both the loss function and the mean squared error function. So then we will be able to see how well our model is doing on this uh, when, it, when we train it. Um, uh, so then it's time here for actually do some training. So we need to add some uh, some function here in a run function. So let's do like this. Uh, so what we do here is first we convert the data to tensors. And then after that, we extract the inputs and the labels. And then we train our model using a model or inputs and our labels. And then we just write down on the console that we are done training. So now let's switch over to uh, let's switch over to the browser and then we run this. Oh, uh, there was an error. Yeah, I think I added one. Uh, One uh, moment here. Yeah, we're over here. And I got, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, sorry about that there. Yeah, so what we get here is uh, uh, first uh, a visualization of data, our model summary. And then we can see here that we are using this callback in order to do monitoring of our training. Um, so we see here the loss function and the mean squared error function uh, for each epoch. And we've said that we wanted to have 50 epochs. And then we would like to have these values as low as possible and preferably sooner rather than later. So now we can see we're approaching 40 epochs and then we're uh, soon finished with training. And then we can uh, make a mental note here that uh, I can say here also it's done training. That here is somewhere 0 0.04 for our loss function. So let's say here that we are satisfied with our uh, machine learning model and how it performs. Then the next thing that we want to do is actually to make some predictions. So uh, we will add a function here where we can test our model. Let's uh, add a function, new function to our script. And let's go back here. So 
so um, so what we do here in the test model is we are generating a hundred new uh, values here and then uh, for uh, horsepower and then we'll see what miles per gallon values our model will predict so then after that we just call model.predict with our with these hundred values and then we get our predictions and then after that we're using this x uh, this mean uh, mean and max values in order to do this unnormalization so that we can get our data our predictions back into the original scale and then we return this unnormalized data and then finally what we do is we render a new scatter plot using this tensorflow visualization component so that we can plot our model predictions uh, versus the original data um, and then we just need to run this function also in our run function so uh, let us go to our run function and and add this uh, test model this yep so here we basically run this test model and then we plot it out on a uh, scatter plot so let's save this and let's go over to browser this and then as you can see here we are always doing this first plot and then we are printing out the model summary and we also do the actual training uh, but this is just an example here so in a real world case you wouldn't need to do this do this every time so what is important here is that you monitor your machine learning model so that you can quickly detect if there are any larger deviations and if there is then you would probably need to do a retraining of your model um, but now it is soon uh, finish with its training and then we will have a look at what our test looks like so let's see here yes that's done training and now we can see here that this uh, the blue dots is our real data and then our orange line here is our predictions and then we can see that you know, our data is actually some sort of a non-linear relation because it's a curve, but now uh, our prediction is a straight line. So, um, uh, so it doesn't take into account this non-linearity aspects of our data, but maybe uh, there is something that we can do about it. So let us go back to where we define our model and see if we can do something so that we can get a better result. Let me switch over to this is to the code, and then we have to find where we define our machine learning model, which is a little bit higher up here, which is over here, and then we can uh, uncomment this or comment out this, and then add some new code. So here what we do here is we still are using our sequential uh, model and then after that we add some some more layers to our model and these layers what is great with this is that by adding these layers we will be able to take into account this non-linearity aspects of our data so in theory this model should perform better than our first model so let us save this and then let us go back to our browser and let's run this So now we can also see here that uh, our model summary looks different because we have a new model. So we can see here that we have four different layers and we can also see that we have many more number of parameters which can take into account this non-linearity. So we have, for example, in a third layer, we have 4,160 different parameters that can be used to train in order to make a good prediction. And then we can also see here on our monitoring that we reach uh, a low value of our loss and our mean squared error much faster just after 10 epochs. And if you remember, the, our previous was somewhere around 0 0.04, whereas this is 0 
0, 16. So we also get a much lower value, which is a good thing for us. And then finally, we can see here that our predictions are, are much better than what it was before, that we can actually take into account that there is some sort of nonlinearity in our data. So this concludes uh, our first uh, demo here. And what I would like you to take away as key points here is that now what we can do is we can both do uh, some some data analysis here that, that we did. We can do some plotting and see if there are some relations in the data. And then after that, we can print out our model summary. And then we can also do our training also here in the browser. And we can finally, we can do some tests here to check how well our model is performing. And as you can see here from the amount of code we wrote, it's not so terribly much code that we need to write. And in addition, we can also, we didn't need to write any code in order to do this visualization that we've done here on the right-hand side of the browser. So instead, what we did was we made use of this already existing functionality in the TensorFlow visualization component. So now let me switch back here to, to the browser and let me take a little bit of water. So now uh, it's also the case here that you can also use uh, already existing models. So for example, you can, you can use uh, MobileNet, which is uh, a Keras model, and you can convert this Keras model from the H5 format to the TensorFlow.js layers format. And you can do this using a tool, the TensorFlow.js converter, and you can do it either from the bash or from the command line, and you can see the um, syntax here on this slide. Or you can also do it from Python. So in Python, what you can do is you can import Keras, you're going to import TensorFlow.js, and you can also import TensorFlow. And then you load your mobile net model, and then after that, you run TensorFlow.js, converters, save Keras model, and then you define what your uh, model, what's the name should be. And then in your JavaScript application, what you then do is you import the TensorFlow.js uh, library, and then you can load your layers model using TensorFlow load layers model. And we actually, we're going to do this for our second example here in a short while. Um, but you might ask yourself here, well, so why would we want to use uh, TensorFlow.js in the first place? Um, so some of the reasons or some of the advantages could be that you don't need to learn another language. You don't need to learn Python or R or Conda or Jupyter notebooks or anything. You can use uh, the JavaScript libraries and the functionalities that you are already used to, uh, to use. And then the second is that you don't need any round trip between the client and the server because everything will happen on the device. Uh, and, um, uh, and also a benefit by that is that also the user data will be more secure because everything is happening locally. Uh, so there is a minimum risk of having a man in the middle attack, for example. Then you're using the browser as a um, highly interactive user interface uh, that people are used to. And you can also take easily access to sensors like the webcam and the microphone. And you could also take advantage of the GPU. So there are uh, some three different main ways that you can use TensorFlow.js. Either you can run existing models that you just uh, make use of out of the box, or you can also retrain existing models so you can make them more specialized. Or a third way is, as we did in our first example here, is that you can develop your machine learning model from scratch using JavaScript. So some of the existing models uh, that we can uh, use are, for example, models for image classification or for object detection or for post estimation and so on. So in our next example, we're actually going to make use of this image net model in order to make an image classifier. So let me switch over here to the browser. And then we're going to have a look at what this looks like. So what, uh, what you do here is you first you select an image. And then after that, you select a model here. So we select the mobile net model. And then after that, you do predict. So here we can see that our machine learning model predicts that this is a strawberry with 99.9% .9 probability. So the question is, how did we actually do this? 
So, uh, let, so let us switch over here to wishes to the code. Um, just over here. So here, uh, this first HTML file is just the user interface where we can select our model and we can select our image and we have this predict button, for example. But the important thing here is that we are using TensorFlow uh, JS and then we're also using a class here called predict. So it's in the predict class that all of machine learning uh, will take place. And we also have a file called imagenet underscore classes that I will show you in a short while what that is. But if I have a look here in the predict.js file, you can see here that we, when we, uh, when we load in an image, we read in the image into a file reader. And then when we uh, change a model selector, we call a function a load model with the name of the model that we selected. And then we also have a directory structure here on our left-hand side. So for example, here's the mobile net model. So then what we do here is we load TensorFlow load layers model, and then we just go into this directory and then we load this model.json file. And the way that we uh, achieve this model.json file together with this shard files is through this converter uh, utility that I was showing uh, a couple of slides ago. So we've actually we've converted a Keras.h5 model into a TensorFlow.js layers model. And then that's why we can use this in our web application here. Now when we push uh, the predict button, uh, then we load the image and we load the model name. And then we need to do some pre-processing because remember here that when we're using TensorFlow, all of our data needs to be in the tensor format. So we need to somehow convert our image data into the tensor uh, format. So we do that so that we get it into tensor format and then we uh, only need to call model.predict with our tensor data. And then we get our predictions and then we just sort out the top five predictions and then we get the probability back from the mobile net model and we also get an index, index back. So this index is an index into this file or image net classes. So uh, the image net classes is just just a mapping here between an index and also what it is in clear text that our model has uh, has classified. So that is, is basically it. So we can see here that by using an already existing model, there is even less code for us to write and we can make use of some predefined functions here in order to get our answers. So let me switch back to the presentation. So now in our final part here of my presentation here, I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about some real world examples. Um, so, um, so the first real world example here is from Uber. So Uber has a, a tool they called Uber Manifold. So Uber Manifold is a visual debugging tool which uses TensorFlow.js. I can read more about it here on the link or GitHub where there is more information about this tool. And the second example is from Airbnb. So they have something they call an identity document, identity document detection. So the way it works is that when you want to rent out your apartment, it could be that you run the risk of maybe having you know, your passport or maybe your driver's license in these pictures that you upload to Airbnb. So what they have done is they have made a function that runs in the browser on the client that they call identity document detection. So it will automatically detect and warn the user that this image contains a driver's license picture or maybe a passport picture or some personal sensitive information. And then our final example here is from Magenta. Uh, so Magenta, uh, they are making uh, a music uh, software and they have a tool called Magenta Studio, and here they're using machine learning models in order to automatically generate music. I can also have a look more in depth on this uh, link here on this slide. So uh, finally, I also have some references. I hope you find this interesting and that you want to learn more about it. So I have some references here for you. So one is the official TensorFlow documentation, and then there are also some very interesting courses on Coursera, like the introduction to TensorFlow course. 
And if you want to know more about this conversion of the H5 model and image classifier, then there's a free YouTube series called Deep Lizard where you can learn more about that. And you can also have a look at some different code labs on the google.com code labs uh, pages. So with that, I would like to thank all of you who was tuning in here to my session. And if you have any comments or any questions, you can always reach me either on Twitter, where my handle is Agravelis, or you can reach me on email on this email address that you can see here on this slide. So with that said, I would like to wish all of you a continued good Scotland Summit. And if you, uh, if you see something interesting, you can tweet on this Twitter handle uh, that is active here today. So thank you so much for your time.